Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Lori Fogarty. I'm the director here at the Oakland Museum of California and delighted to welcome you all today and uh, thrilled to see so many wonderful colleagues in the arts community here. And I want to begin by saying Happy Lunar New Year. We are so honored to have you here for this program, which is part of our 50th anniversary celebrations, our OMCA at 50 Community Conversations, Exploring Public Art Practice. Today's symposium is very generously supported by the Kenneth Raynan Foundation and is part of its Open Spaces program, which funds temporary place-based public art projects in Oakland and San Francisco that engage communities, support artistic experimentation, and energize public spaces. Through this symposium, the foundation aims to grow critical discourse among artists and expand dialogue on the opportunities and challenges of working in public space. And at this time, I had been planning to introduce Karina Gould. Karina is a collaborator with the museum. She is uh, part of the Confederated Villages of Lisan, an Ohlone-born uh, leader, cultural leader, and raised in Oakland. And unfortunately, Karina is ill. And so she was going to join us to provide a welcome. And so we sent her our best and just acknowledge that our hope had been to have a native uh, welcome for you today as well. But with that, uh, we're going to start the program. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce our leader, our guide, our MC for the day, Liz Ogbu. Uh, we've had the um, real honor of working with Liz here at the museum. She is a designer, and this is the best title ever, spatial justice activist. Oh, and she will guide us through the day. Thank you all for being here. And Liz, come to the stage. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? There are many phones already up on here. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. And I honestly said yes to this, in part because the program looked so cool that I was like, I'm going to be here anyway. I might as well help. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, um, it's kind of funny, we've uh, been talking all uh, morning that it's such a small world and I can't see any of you in the audience right now, but I know that I know several of you. And so to be able to have a forum where we can all come together um, and be able to talk about uh, some of the key issues that we're facing in the work, uh, talk about who our collaborators are, who they could be, it, it's a really special gift. And so for those of you who've come in today, thank you for taking your time today to be able to participate in this conversation. So um, as Lori said, I'm a little bit of a guide. Uh, there's a lot in the program that you'll be doing yourself, but I'm gonna try and see if I can gently steer the ship to where we need to go. And hopefully uh, by the end of the day, we can treat this as like one giant conversation and that where we end is a better place and a richer place than where we started. So I wanted to just start with um, a quote that I've really loved for years. Um, it's by Fabiana Rodriguez, who many of you know, an amazing local artist. Um, and she said that before there can be political change, there must be cultural change. And so I think regardless of what side of the political fence that you fall on, um, it feels like we're definitely in a time where things are unsettled, unclear, and uncomfortable. And whether we realize it or not, the environments that we spend our lives in um, are impacted by this. They are also reflections of it. And because everything is basically a loop, they are also things that continue to shape us. So it's appropriate that we have arrived um, today to be able to have a conversation where we're gonna be hearing from and interacting with people whose very practice engages in the experiences of those spaces, both in terms of how the space is shaped, but also how we position ourselves within it. So I'm inviting you over the course of today to learn, to share your own experiences, because I believe everybody in this room is an artist and a creator in their own right, and to discuss the challenges and opportunities of engaging communities through artistic experimentation in public space. Um, as part of today, we're gonna to be hearing from nationally recognized artists, performers, and activists, 
And um, the lights are low, but I'm going to, um, if we can maybe raise them just a little bit, I want to just introduce all the artists that we're going to be hearing from today so you can know who they are. And so artists, when I call out your name, if you wouldn't mind just standing if you're able and waving so people know who you are. Um, so our keynote, uh, which I'm going to be introducing shortly, is going to be from Public Matters. And then, um, as you see in your program, this lovely thing here, um, we're going to have several breakout sessions. And um, those artists participating in that are Kristen Damro, Sergio De La Torre, and Chris Tajari, Rafa Esparza. Su Han Ho, <laughs> core team members from Odessa Jones Medea Project, Faye Bonglon, <laughs> Felicia Skaggs, and Angela Wilson, <laughs> Rachel McCrafty, <laughs> and Dee Nichols. So I don't know about you, but I'm really excited to engage with all of them today. So I'm going to just take you through a very quick rundown of what we're going to do today. As I mentioned, it's all in this lovely program that you should have gotten when you came in. So don't try and remember everything I'm saying. Just refer to it if you get lost. Um, so first, this morning, before, uh, we're going to hear from Public Matters. They're going to give us a lovely keynote about their work. Um, after that keynote, we're all going to come up on stage. Um, they described it as we're going to have a Liz sandwich. I would like to say that I'm basically going to be channeling Oprah, and um, we're going to have a conversation about their work, and hopefully use that as a pivot point to set up the rest of the day. At 1.30, uh, sorry, right after that, we're going to break for lunch, and then after lunch, at 1.30, we're going to jump into the first breakout session. And um, you should basically treat this like the museum has basically become one giant artist studio with lots of different artists um, showing us a window into their practice. So um, there will be two uh, sets of breakout sessions. Um, they're basically identical, and it's really just to give you an opportunity to try different things. Um, you can pick one and then go to another in the second session. So the first session starts at 1.30, and the second session starts at 3, um, which basically means we're going to have seven concurrent sessions in each breakout session slot. Um, and so you'll only get to choose two, which I know is really hard. At least it's hard for someone like me who totally suffers from indecision. Um, but Whichever two you choose will be perfect. They'll be amazing. And hopefully you have a friend here or you'll make a friend throughout the day and maybe they'll go to different sessions and you can trade notes at the end. Um, you won't, as I said, you won't be able to see everything, but hopefully what you do see will inspire you to learn more. And because all of the artists are listed in the program, you can go and look at their work online or track them down afterwards if you don't get to see an artist today. Um, Feel free to reach out to any OMCA staff. They'll all be hanging out around, hopefully with things that identify themselves as staff. Um, and basically, your job today is just to be inspired and to have fun. So um, I'm going to kick things off and stop talking. Uh, I want to introduce our keynote for today. Um, as I said, it's Public Matters. They are a Los Angeles-based creative studio for civic engagement that uses socially engaged art to leverage greater inclusion, public participation, and transformative change. Um, we have, from Public Matters, Mike Blockstein, who is the co-founder and principal, as well as a visual artist and educator, and Rihanna Strada, who's also a co-founder, and she's the creative director, and also one-third of, and I did not know this until I had to read this bio, Mail Order Brides, MOB, a Filipina American artist girl gang, which sounds awesome. I have known, <laughs> I kind of want to be a proxy member. Um, I have known Mike and Rianne for years. We travel in a lot of the same circles, so for me it's an extra special gift to be able to not only introduce them, but have a conversation after. So I would say buckle up, and Mike and Rianne, come on. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Wow. I'm 
it's very difficult to see everybody, but I can feel the energy. Thank you for being here. So good morning. Um, it's really, you know, just to pick up on what Liz is saying, uh, it's really our honor and privilege to be here with new friends, artists whose work we've seen from a distance, but also with there are a lot of people we know that are here who we deeply cherish and you inspire us every day. And to have you here today is, is really special for us. So I'm Mike. I'm Rianne. And I think that word inspiration has been thrown around a lot. We will try to do our best. Um, and um, to kind of uh, to kick us off, um, we're going to start with what I imagine is a, it's a flashback montage with narrative voiceover. All right, ready? I mean, we live in Los Angeles. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. A marketing campaign to promote healthy eating featuring residents of East Los Angeles and Boyle Heights, including vegetarian zombies. Okay, a choreographed bike train convergence at sunset from five different neighborhoods. Conversations about community cohesion, gentrification, and displacement over fried pork skin, AKA chicharron. Market makeovers, transforming corner stores to increase healthy food access. Our Urban Futures Lab fellows visit Chicago for the first time and present at open engagement. I'm going to change it up a little bit. <clears throat> Giant flavored cigarillos storm the steps of LA City Hall to advocate for World No Tobacco Day. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> High school students, transportation engineers, and USC Price groups who, believe me, would otherwise not meet, bond together over traffic safety. All right. Experience local stories of Los Angeles historic Filipino town on a vintage 1944 Surround Motor Company jeepney. <laughs> Maiden voyage blessed by priest and christened by now Mayor Eric Garcetti. Sweet! Seniors, flash, Los Angeles drivers on Temple Street. <laughs> All right, thank you for indulging us. That was kind of more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so as Liz said, we are a creative studio for civic engagement. Um, Public Matters has, uh, is um, between is 13 going on 14 years old. So we're a cranky teenager. Um, but we are engaged in, in um, creative, collaborative acts for public good. Um, and before we get started, I also want to give a shout out um, to our, um, our folks here in the Bay Area. I think I see David Lawrence. Dave, will you stand up, please? Say hi. <laughs> Public Matters. All right. Say hello to Dave. Oh, where's McCray? Oh, where's McCray? You sneak in? There he is oh, in the back. There's McCray Parker. McCray Parker. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're rolling large today. This is awesome. Okay. All right, so um, admittedly, uh, Public Matters is a big experiment, right? It's a social enterprise. We are not a nonprofit. Um, and when we started this, it was um, you know, with a group of folks, um, from uh, us from Los Angeles, but also people from the Bay Area. And we were interested in um, kind of expanding um, our collective impact, uh, the collective impact of our respective practices. We wanted to be able to do things beyond what we would be able to do alone. Um, and so we, we, when we undertook this, it was with the hope that we would be able to, uh, to be able to access greater streams of funding that might be available to maybe just a nonprofit artist startup. Right? And um, one of the things that we, we've taken the spirit of, um, of experimentation such that even though we strive to succeed, we always welcome the opportunity to fail forward. So this is really the center of our work, which is addressing the trust gap. So that, as we know, there is a gap between institutions, between neighborhoods, between communities. And, and the question is, you know, this morning when we were walking over here, like I, I saw a sign on a, I think it was a BART yard, and it, you know, had the standard like, no trespassing, no loitering, blah, 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 right? Somebody wrote on top of that, 
stop inequality. And I love the fact, first off, that that was a message on top, which is if we're talking about trust, trust is earned, right? Trust is built. Trust is built through relationships, through engagement, through an authentic and reciprocal exchange. Um, beyond that, though, there's language barriers. And we're not just talking about English and other you know, spoken languages, Spanish, Tagalog, et cetera. We're talking about languages of professionalism, right? And where oftentimes what we're trying to do is work with people who come from professional and institutional backgrounds and make sure that they understand how to speak people, right? Strip away the jargon, embrace people, learn how to like be in a participatory action. Um, likewise, we wanna make sure that residents know enough kind of professional talk that they're taken seriously by the professionals. So basically at Public Matters, we're a bunch of slashies, which is less violent than it sounds. Um, so slashies are basically people who don't fit in any neat, discrete buckets. We're kind of messy at the office, right? Like they're people who are, um, who are artists, educators, people with backgrounds in public health, urban planning, um, and, um, but throughout that, there's an interest in, um, in creativity. And, um, and so I think that's an important part of understanding public matters and also understanding that as a hybrid organization, we very much embrace the fact that we're code switching, that we're shape shifting, that we do that Bruce Lee be like water thing, <laughs> right? Um, because a lot of our, our positions end up being as the connective tissue between the different partner organizations with whom we work. So, a quick glimpse of all the different areas that we work in, right? And hopefully you're looking at those and going, oh my God, wait, healthy food access, tobacco control, humanities, parks, green space, that seems like a lot, right? Kind of seems all over the place in a certain way, right? That's the point. Right, that we as artists, we as creative thinkers, people who can bring criticality, have a role to play in all these different disciplines. And that's, that's really what, what we are aspiring to do is you know, when we are working with folks from these arenas, we're bringing something a little different, which is artistically driven, right? It's fueled by that, by, by inspiration, by imagination, by creativity. And, it's very different than the conventional practices that happen within those disciplines, but we also have to recognize that those folks aren't coming from the places that we come from. So why would they have an artistic or creative practice? They've learned their professions, and that's, there's nothing inherently good or bad or wrong about any of that. It's about the fusion between those things. And so that kind of brings us to where we are here today. Like we're trying to think about how we expand opportunities for artists outside the arts. That's what Public Matters does. Okay, so dramatic pause, wait for it, wait for it, All right? Ta-da! Okay, that feels really good. Do you want to join me? Like, are you all in for it? Okay, ready? I hope they can hear us outside. I love it. Okay, uh, participatory maniacal laughter. Check. Okay, so I don't think we're going to get a lot of arguments about this statement here, um, but let's just talk about this for a second in terms of like what, what, what does that comprise, right? Our, our belief is that the elements that define the arts, imagination, creative expression, experimentation, criticality, those are substantial contributions, right? But the secret is we don't want this just to be like the decorative icing on the cake, right? Um, we need to bake this into the recipe, right? And our work is really about baking into the recipe sometimes in ways that it's so subtle that you don't even know it's there. And we want this to be like that you know, delicious, healthy, binge-worthy food, that cake that we want everybody to eat and digest and keep eating again. All right. So how do we do that, right? All sounds nice so far, right? Nice, nice you know, principles, platitudes, right? 
So let's talk a little bit about how Public Matters goes about this work. So deep hanging out is a concept that comes from anthropology. Uh, Clifford Gertz is the anthropologist who kind of coined the term. And it's really about informal immersion in communities. And the idea that when one is informally immersed in a community, you're embedded. Things start to happen. And our work is then iterative, and it's not prescriptive. It's informed by the dynamics of community, by exchange, by things that can happen spontaneously. Um, it's not informed by our intentions. It's not us coming as artists and saying, hey, we got a great idea. Let's roll this out, right? It's responsive. And therefore, because it's responsive, it's also accountable to the people that have generated those ideas. And that part, while well, there's kind of the incidental and the immersive, there's also the intentional that we do, which is about building those relationships, right? We talked about you know, building trust and, and building, you know, gaining trust. So uh, just as an example of what can transpire, so we've been working with a high school in East LA called the East Los Angeles Renaissance Academy since it started nine years ago. We first started doing work with the high school around healthy food access. But what's interesting and unique about that school is it's one of only three high schools in the country that has a focus on urban planning and policy. And while we were there, we we're kind of like, so where exactly is planning taught? Where's the policy? Because it's a Los Angeles Unified Public School. Right? There's no urban planning class. There's no urban planning curriculum. Um, so we worked with the school to start to build that. But in order to build it, you know, we're not planners. Um, so we brought some friends along uh, from USC Price and developed a relationship between the university and a high school in East LA. Um, but while we're doing that, we're also trying to model and show to the students, like, this could be you, right? There's a professor at Price, Lavana Lewis, who says, you can't be it unless you can see it. So we bring students on field trips to USC and introduce them to planning, to the things that students do, to students' life, because we want them to feel like not only could this be me, but this should be me, right? And um, you see right here, the smiling young woman is Christine, or excuse me, Christine Vasquez. So Christine was one of those students who went on the field trips. Um, and she, she, you know, USC was her dream school. She's the first student from Renaissance Academy in any capacity to be admitted to USC as an undergrad. Um, she's studying planning. Um, all sounds like a good story, right? But I think, you know, we also know that if you come from a community like East LA and you're going to a school like USC, it's not so simple as just the arrival. It's about what happens when you're at that school. You know, the fit, the relationships, all the things that need to happen. So what we were able to do is bring Christine as an intern back into our project, which is called Greens from East LA. And as an intern, lo and behold, she's back in the classroom at her old high school. Um, so that's one step. Another step, though, is that we have friends from the county. So um, the interns had to do a research project. So we hooked Christine up with the county. She did a project exploring uh, what, what would a bike share program look like in East LA. The county loved it so much that she was acknowledged and recognized before the county board of supervisors. So, that's just in her freshman year. <laughs> so she's now interning with us again as a sophomore, but just imagine where this is going to go. And so I think you know, we, when we think about Christine's story, um, it's really in the context of the fact of how public matters looks at our work. Like we're really interested in how systems work and how these things fit together. I mentioned before that we, are, we act as connective tissue we're conduits, we're facilitators. Um, 
we're, we end up kind of being the glue that helps make these collaborations possible. And so, um, you know, we're talking about systems thinking, Q chart, right? We need to have charts. I love making charts. <laughs> Um, and this is, a, this is um, uh, an engagement ecosystem um, from our work with Los Angeles um, DOT's Vision Zero effort. Um, and um, basically this is in, similar to uh, other projects that we've done, but you see a mix of different, um, different type groups of different scales, different types of institutions, um, local businesses, um, nonprofit agencies, schools, and they're all kind of wound up in this project. They're all part of the work to address um, uh, traffic safety. And the thing about this is that this didn't just materialize out of nowhere. This actually took probably like over 10 years to be made possible. Because the only reason the public matters, not being planners, not being tra traffic safety engineers, was able to do this type of work is because we had relationships with people in historic Filipino town in Echo Park in the community. So we were basically set up to be able to take advantage of this opportunity um, to do this work to, uh, to help the community. So when we started working in historic Filipino town over a decade ago, you know, and we would tell people, well, we're working in historic Filipino town, the most common question people would immediately say is, where's that, right? Um, or I didn't know there was a historic Filipino town. Um, and a couple months ago, Time Out Magazine said historic Filipino town was the number five coolest neighborhood in the world. <laughs> and that's not about us, but what we want to talk about is our work in relationship to a community as it goes through changes and, and transformation. Because as you know, particularly for you folks from the Bay Area, you understand what that means, right? When you're the number five coolest neighborhood, what's coming? So when we first started working in historic Filipino town and there was that question about, well, where is it? There's also the question of what is it and why, right? Why is something called historic Filipino town? It's a primarily Latin Latinx community. Um, it's tiny, it's 2.1 square miles, but it's got this really long highway sign because historic Filipino town is a lot of letters. <laughs> so. Um, we partnered and we've kept working with the Filipino Workers Center throughout all of our work. And where we began is with that question about, well, what is the neighborhood? And building a youth media and civic engagement project where really the focus was allowing students to get to know and meet people who had shaped the community and allowing those people to tell the story of the community. Because it's all about who tells the story is connected to who controls the destiny of that community. And that's kind of been our quest all the way through, through the changes, is the connection between story and identity and, all, and how that connects to destiny. So um, through this like, a really robust story gathering project, we didn't want to just hoard it. Right? You, you, when you make stuff, you want to share it with people. So one of the ways that we, uh, that we do this now is intentionally through a project called Hidden Hi-Fi, which is in partnership with Filipino Worker Center. Um, so you're able to experience the neighborhood while driving in uh, this beautiful automotive wonder here, uh, a fil an actual Filipino jeepney that we bought from this guy outside of Seattle. Uh, and now lives in Los Angeles and is kind of the unofficial ambassador of historic Filipino town, automotive ambassador. Um, and so this is a way for us to be able to share the stories that are, for community members, are hidden in plain sight. Because historic Filipino town doesn't have a lot of the visual markers that say, ah, you are in historic Filipino town. It's not like K-Town, Koreatown, or Little Tokyo, um, or Chinatown. Um, Filipinos kind of blend in, right? And so part of what we wanted to do was to be able to elevate those stories and really call attention to the importance of immigrant groups and immigrant stories for, uh, in the history of Los Angeles. So really claim that. Um, and so this is, um, oh, there, here we'll, we'll hit go, there we go. Oops. So this is another um, version of, a, uh, another iteration of the project called Love and Loss and Hi-Fi. Also story gathering um, funded by um, the uh, California Arts Council. Um, and this really explored uh, gentrification and displacement through a series of 
five different events which were embedded within the neighborhood. So the events happened in, um, a, you know, at a spoken word event, um, in, in, a, in a trendy new bar that's owned by three uh, Pinai women, um, at the basement of a church, um, and, a, and then um, also at a house party. We did a house party at a local, um, a local park. Um, and so this was a way for us to continue to collect stories, but to do it in such a way that we weren't expecting people to come to us. Like, we need to be able to go to them, right? The stories live with them. And um, so the, uh, I know, who loves some fried pork skin? Okay, chicharron. So this is uh, our latest project. We um, uh, also a story gathering project, and our uh, wonderful friends at California Humanities made it possible for us to expand the archive of neighborhood, neighborhood stories um, to include voices that weren't there before. And one of the things that we, one of the gaps that we'd always identified was the fact that while it's a largely Philippine, uh, it's a largely a Latinx um, community, like a lot of Los Angeles. Um, so we wanted to make sure that part of the story was also um, represented. And so, you know, why not explore the convergences and connections between Filipinx and Latinx groups through the metaphor of fried pork skin? What better way to look at the, you know, the effects of colonization? You know, the shared labor struggle histories, like all of those things. Made sense to us. Um, so we, uh, you know, if you're curious about it, we have postcards out front. Check it out. It's a, it's a, a free audio walking tour that you can um, that you can experience. All to say that throughout this process, you know, we are getting like we're able to be doing deep hanging out and getting to know community members, right? Learning their stories, and that made it possible for us to pivot to do this. When LADOT had their, you know, their opportunity to address traffic safety on Temple Street, which was, which is one of the um, high injury network corridors, one of the most dangerous streets in the city, that happened to be in historic Filipino town, we'd jump on that, right? Because we could bring people along with us. So for the first, um, so we're, uh, in uh, the first round of Temple Street slow jams, um, was very, very much um, spectacle fueled, right? We did, we had these, as you can see, giant cardboard props. We engaged in crosswalk choreography to try to get people to slow down to save lives, and we hosted a bunch of parties because you know, folks in the neighborhood they like to have a good time. But throughout this, we're also collecting people's stories and their impressions about the neighborhood, and we delivered it to our friends at Los Angeles um, Department of Transportation. The, uh, the second year that we did it, um, we tried to make a case for how important it was not to just be about the spectacle. Makes for really great pictures, nice press, but does it really actually make a difference? Um, and we wanted to, uh, you know, we, we talked to our friends at um, LADOT and tried to make the case that we needed to go back and go deeper and work directly with community members to build their capacity to be able to advocate on their own behalf. So what we ended up doing was a version of our, you know, addressing the trust gap where we brought folks together from the community um, along with our friends at Los Angeles Walks, great pedestrian safety advocacy folks, along with um, transportation planners and local elected officials at their neighborhood councils. And they were all talking about traffic safety. So, and, and just to throw in one other element, while all these things are going on, developers are trying to rebrand historic Filipino town, right? Yeah. Oh, it's South Echo, because it's by Echo Park, or it's Silver Lake, or it's Silver Lake adjacent, right? Um, sorry, it was the hands. I know, I know. <laughs> we talked about this. We talked about the reach. I get excited. <laughs> And speaking of reach, <laughs> let's talk about grasp, okay? Because developers are reaching and trying to grasp and claim a name. And the question is, how does the community make sure that it's holding to that name, to its identity, right? So throughout all this I, you know, work around storytelling, story gathering, is the question of amplification, right? How, how does the work get out in the world? How do we make sure that people don't just ask anymore, oh, historic Filipino town, yeah, I saw it in Time Out Magazine, that's that cool spot, I can eat there, you know, I got some good drinks, da 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 But, oh, yeah, I get it. There's a community here. There's roots. There's identity. 
There's pride. There's something unique about this neighborhood. This is really emblematic of Los Angeles. We should cherish it. We should treasure it. So it's a question of like, our work is always about like how we are working within those zones and those contexts, right? But at the same time, you know, we told you we're a social enterprise. What the heck? Um, which means that, you know, I, we always have to say in air quotes, we're a business, right? You know, we're artists. Uh, business <laughs> isn't our natural thing. But at the same time, we have to talk to potential clients, whether they're a university or a municipal agency or a community-based organization. And we have to like, talk about, well, what is the value of all this work that we're doing? You know, why, why would we want to work with you? And what are you going to do that's going to be beneficial to us? So we want to share a little bit of like, how we talk with folks. So, because you might be thinking, hmm, this all sounds cool, but there's a little bit of a contradiction that I can see here, which is that if you're talking about working with institutions, institutions by kind of their definition are inherently about self-perpetuation, right? You have to preserve and maintain the institution, its core, and that can lead to certain practices which can be exclusionary or can be about repetition or they can be about you know, basically self-preservation and avoiding risk at all costs. Whereas artists, creative folks, this is kind of like how we are, right? There's this term called the infinite mindset by Simon Sinek is, is kind of the advocate for it. Uh, He's an author, he's one of those motivational speakers, right? And he talks about it that the infinite mindset is really about being comfortable in the uncomfortable, right? It's about embracing uncertainty and experimentation. And as artists, that's kind of who we are, right? This is in our DNA. We like that. To create, we have to do that, right? We have to take something and turn it into something that's slightly different, right? So um, that contradiction, though, is actually the key to opening the door. Because if you know, we're, we acknowledge that institutions, there's this trust gap, that's an opportunity for what we can bring, which is participation, engagement, dialogue, connecting with you know, what institutions might identify as populations, we would identify as people, um, <laughs> in ways that are meaningful and authentic, that get away from the conventional standards of, well, there's the two minute period for public commentary, or there's a community meeting that is held at a time when the community can't go to the meeting. So this is a, this is a process that becomes reciprocal. And ultimately, what does it do? It strengthens the institution. So that's one of our points. I think it's a good selling point. I, I would buy that. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> Um, and, and so like one of the other th uh, talking points that we use is this, we borrow from our friends in public health, um, this notion that um, preventative is more cost effective in the long run than emergency room care, right? Because if your relationships are broken, your system is not as healthy, and so you're gonna suffer more damage, right? And so this is the kind of thing that, uh, that totally like on, on cue happened in Los Angeles with, with LA Vision Zero. Um, you know, the mayor is very gung-ho to pass this, and then um, in, uh, on the west side in um, Mar Vista, they did, all, like, they did road reconfigurations, lane reconfigurations, bike lanes, a few speed bumps, all things to, you know, to really make people safer on the street. Incredible pushback. People loved their cars and they were angry. There were, they were like putting out petitions to recall their local council person, right? No, it's for real, serious. Like that's, that's a serious political cost, right? That, that, that politician and the council lost political capital because of that. And then it made, they made such a stink that they had to roll it back and undo all that they did. 
there's a giant hole in the like pocket where the money's supposed to be, right? So at the end of so at the end of the day, what's more cost effective? What's more efficient to do something wrong and then go back like undo it and redo it? Hope you get it right. Undo it, redo it, or is the approach like or is the smarter, less insane approach? to actually, you know, like see if you could like build up your relationships with community members. People spend money on marketing. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot on marketing. But community engagement, public engagement, that's where the real work needs to happen, right? So um, this week we went to a talk at USC Price and uh, one of the panelists was uh, Professor Dr. Earl Southers, and, and he said something that he said, you know what, without data, you're just another person with opinion. And, you know, nice catchy phrase, right? Quantity, quantity. Yes, data. Measurable it is data. a school of policy. We are driven by data. We know information. Therefore, we know how to proceed. So um, question, though, that we might ask is, well, you know, how inclusive is your data, right? How representative is it? How much does it include not just the quantitative, but the qualitative, right? Does it have local knowledge? Does it have community wisdom? Does it have stories? Does it have participation? Does it have engagement? Does it have something that is robust and all people will recognize it? Not only that, is it a system of just simply collecting? But it is a system of exchange. Is it a system of reciprocity? This is what we strive for because these are the things that are going to push against this idea always that working in communities is coming up with solutions. It's hard to get to solutions. What we need to think about is progress, right? Progress is participation, it's engagement, it's all those things that I was just talking about. Progress keeps driving us because we also have to acknowledge that data, data sets, information constantly is going to change, right? But when you're looking at a data set that comes from 10 years ago and that's what you had, you're losing an opportunity because there's a way to get input all the way through. So we've just, you know, shared with you some of our talking points. But you know, artists gotta hustle. And we're entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, right? That's that's technically a term. We're uh, yeah, social I entrepreneurs. I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, like and so in this case, like, you know, um, you don't want to leave it up to chance. So part of what we have to do is to also um, while we're talking to people about our ideas, we're also we also need to make sure that we're seeding. Um, the possibilities for collaboration in other places, right, and among other people, um, and so which is why we, you know, make friends with someone who, like, make friends with people um, outside the arts, um, because really we uh, we do need moles. Um, institutions are notoriously difficult to move, but we have to remind ourselves that those institutions are also made of people, and if you get the right people, the right numbers mix, then maybe we can start to make change happen, right? So to that point of not just waiting for that to happen or trying to think about, well, finding that particular person within an, or, you know, an institution, Public Matters also developed a few years ago our own fellowship program uh, called Urban Futures Lab. And so um, Urban Futures Lab is, you know, it's a, it's a paid two-year fellowship for young adults of color um, who come from, out, come from throughout LA. Um, and, and they're really coming to us at a point where they know they want to do something that contributes to the social good, to, to the fabric, right? Um, they're not quite sure how to do that, what it looks like, but they also come from places where they, they don't come from a community where there are a lot of resources, where there are role models, where there are mentors, 
if you go back to that phrase about, you know, you can't be it unless you can see it, part of our work with the Urban Futures Lab is to help our fellows develop a network, um, build up their skills and their disciplines across fields. Because these are all the subject areas that we work with and teach fellows. These are our learning modules over a two-year period, right? So you could look at that and say, huh, basically we are just training them to be better slashies. <laughs> I mean, but like, you know, if you have people with these skills, wouldn't you want to hire them, right? Right, and I think that is the point that we believe that all of these skills are necessary to do work that's committed to social change. But also, they're skills that allow somebody to move laterally throughout the course of their professions as their interests change, as their networks change, as opportunities change, as the world and the marketplace changes. Um, but also, you might go, hmm, so we're artists, but we're not talking about the next generation of artists. We're talking about working with young adults who have an arts and creative civic engagement strategy that they've learned through their engagement with public matters that we hope they're gonna take wherever they go, right? They may be going into urban planning, they might be going into public health, they might be going into environmental justice, but we know in their roots they also embrace the arts. Um, so, and I just want to like brag about a couple of our former fellows for a second. <laughs> so, um, and to talk again about relationship building. So, um, this is a story of, that's Andy, that's Shirley. Uh, on the left is the two of them when we first met them, probably, probably the first day or second day. They were juniors in high school. Um, they went to the East Los Angeles Renaissance Academy. They worked with us on a project around healthy food access. Andy and Shirley, we kept working with them probably for the next eight years. Um, they were high school students, then they became what we called community liaisons where they went to another high school, they trained other students around healthy food access. Uh, Shirley went to college, she interned with us, Andy kept hanging around. Uh, they, we worked with them through Greetings from East LA, so the, all of a sudden this is them back in the classroom of the high school where they went where you know, three, four years later, the students are going, who's that old person? <laughs> and they're going, Mike, they call me Miss. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> welcome to my world. <laughs> I'm the old guy, <laughs> right? But this is also about thinking about the continuum, right? So as they progress beyond their fellowships, Andy was always interested in business and entrepreneurship, but really, the thing that he consistently said to us is, I just want to find a way where I can support my family. So Andy works in the private sector, um, and lo and behold, he's his dad's boss now. <laughs> he hired his dad to work for him. Shirley, you know, has consistently said, I love East LA, I just want to find a way to talk about and support and be engaged in my community. So she's worked on healthy food access, she's worked in the, the work with us, but beyond that, Shirley now goes to community meetings. She's the rabble rouser in the meeting who's always like, wait a minute, we need to think about the community here. So the Obama Foundation is about to launch an online curriculum about how to work in communities. Guess who's the featured community change agent? Ms. Shirley Ramirez. So, Feeling a little inspired, I hope? <laughs> okay, let's get to the inevitable conclusion. <laughs> so like, we're, we're not lying. Eventually, we're all gonna go, right? <sighs> yeah. But I, I will say that when I do go, uh, you know, I will, like, I'll go more easily knowing that folks like Andy, Shirley, Christine, and the parents from, um, from Padre San Acción are there to continue the work. Um, because they, you know, to the point of there not being solutions, only progress, this stuff keeps going. And we have to remember that, right? Um, 
the other thing that come you know that comes when you kind of confront your own mortality um, is that you know our time is limited. That's real, and that also means that our time is precious, um, and so we have to do what we can to um, to spend it wisely. Um, so to close, I'm going to share a story with you that I hope you will find helpful. Some months ago, I was um, at a Filipino Worker Center um, for a meeting. And they're always, you know, the, the agency is a organizing, um, organi organizing organization at heart. Like they do stuff around immigrants' rights, workers' justice. They're always organizing something. Um, on this particular day, um, it was particularly, it was, it was busy, busier than usual. And down the hall, I could hear music playing. I like music, right? Listening to it, it's a song and it repeats again. This does it a couple more times. The song repeats. I'm like, huh, curious. The song, um, some of you might know it, Queen, I Want to Break Free, right? Personal fave, if only because the video is genius. <laughs> if you haven't checked it out, it is amazing. Um, that said, so I like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling the siren call of Freddie Mercury and I'm being drawn to the room where this music is coming from. And I like go over and I like, on the way I almost like run into Tori who, who works there. She's one of the organizers. And I'm like, so Tori, what's up, right? So they, what, were they, what they were doing was they were rehearsing. They were rehearsing for a lip sync battle. Choreography, microphones, everything. I didn't hear any of it because it's lip sync. All I could hear was like Freddie Mercury. But that's what they were doing. And they were doing that as, as preparation for a convening they were hosting the next day. The symposium, where they were meeting with different folks, was around human trafficking. I was speechless. And, though, and folks who know me know that's really rare. <laughs> But at this moment, I was speechless. And, um, and, and Tori looks at me, and she says, this work is hard. Those stories are painful. We need this. If we lose our joy, if we surrender our laughter, they win. And at that moment, you know, the, I was like, oh my gosh, the, the, the universe basically gifted me a moment of clarity, you know, became this kind of gentle reminder that creative acts, music, performance, costumes, lip sync battles, those things are all absolutely essential to the work that we do. Thank you for listening. Um, I feel like I was just nerding out for a bit, so I got a lot of questions, but <laughs> I also um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I feel like I, I, I learned. Um, one is that you guys are actually a comedy duo, <laughs> with Mike being the straight man. <laughs> Leanne bringing, comic, Leanne bringing comic relief. I also realized that I should incorporate more maniacal laughter in my talks. It's free. <laughs> Go for it. Um, that there is such a thing as creative abundance, which I think is a lot of what you talked about, um, and that we're all going to die eventually. <laughs> and I could stop there, but I think there's a lot more richness um, to, to what you guys talked about. So first of all, thank you. That was super insightful, and, and I think that last point that you ended on is something that I want to start with. Um, because, um, you know, in all seriousness, even as I was sort of saying that you guys incorporate the special voices and, and there was joy in your presentation, uh, even though a lot of the issues that you were talking about were actually really hard. And so um, I wanted to start with just like, how do we reset this narrative? I think sometimes when we talk about doing joyous stuff in communities like the ones that we work in, um, we get a pushback, right? That we're not being serious enough, that it's just really frivolous. 
And so I maintain that joy should not be a luxury, that everyone has the right to joy. So how do we help reset that narrative? Like you had that moment, right? Yeah. But how do we transport it so that we're not having to answer questions or justify bringing that kind of stuff in and saying that they are an essential part of our projects? So I would say that, um, yeah, sometimes that happens. It's not, it's not that serious, right? But it's important. Who would want to go without joy? So if we're talking about things that are essential here, then that, those things should be kind of non-negotiable. I mean, I, like I might argue, like if I'm being a smart ass about it, it's like, well, if that's like a, like a, a universal basic uh, right would be joy, right? So why doesn't all the projects have some version of that tied to it? Which is not to mean that like everybody needs to have like maniacal laughter, like doubled over and doing those instead of ab crunches, but still, you know, I think we, we, we need to, a lot of it is really about reframing what's important here. What is going to connect with people? And yes, suffering, um, uh, you know, uh, traumatic experiences are ways that we can connect. But, but joy is also extremely essential. Because um, when Tori said that, like it really dawned on me, it's, it was like, yes, you need to acknowledge the full range of your humanity. You're not just about the suffering. So, and what I what I want <clears throat> want to add to that is, um, so one of our mottos is the idea about playing well with others, right? And and in unpacking that phrase a little bit is first off the idea of play, but also well with others. So it's participatory, but kind of inherent in that as as we talk about processes of civic engagement and participation. That shouldn't be something that's a chore. I mean, there are, there are a lot of folks who work for agencies that they hate going to those meetings where it's the two-minute commentary or the community meeting because it's kind of a setup for them, right. right? They know they're just gonna get yelled at because there's no room, not just for play, but for exchange, for dialogue. Um, we need to reframe that as well so that that idea of like being part of a community is a joyful process. There's no reason it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And it seems within that last point that you're making also is really interested in this idea of resetting what is it that we're heading towards, right? I think sometimes with art and design, there's a sense that we're creating a product. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's about the output as opposed to the outcome. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when you started to talk about progress, to me, actually, you were talking about process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I almost started to imagine like a, a, a river, <laughs> right? Like that just keeps on flowing and flowing mm -hmm. and has all of these tributaries that it might take, but it's not like, I mean, some rivers do end, but the, it's about that flow. Mm -hmm. And so what are the things that, you know, I think in some of these meetings, people on both sides will mm -hmm. get very discouraged, right? Because right? in many of the projects you talked about, it's years and years and years and years, and that's what I experienced in mine as well. And so how do you keep people faithful and encouraged about sticking with the river? when they're maybe like, you know, I've been on this way too long, I'm ready to get out. I think kind of at the core of the work practice is to constantly just see people and hear them where they are, because that changes. And so I think, you know, not all relationships are, are, are going to endure forever. But um, while we have those relationships, I think we can, we can tend them and cultivate them so that it becomes meaningful for everybody to continue the relationship. Mm -hmm. Like there is no, there's no guarantee, but I think the, the way that we think about that is to really start, um, uh, it, it's, it's to start with making sure that it's a dynamic process, that we continue to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And that's how you keep it fresh. And I think the, uh, when you talked about uh, 
the product part of it, ooh, that gave me all, all kinds of tingles, you know, just because it's like one of, my, one of my pet peeves. I'll, I'll say it right now, I know this is being recorded. Also, um, replicability and scalability, discuss. Um, but beyond that, you know, just uh, when we're talking about solutions, I feel like it's, a, it's kind of, um, it's, an, it's an illusion. It's a, it's a false goal, right? Because anybody who's involved in social justice work knows we can, we, yes, we can, we can push, we can you know, try to advance, but that's no guarantee. That doesn't mean they can't roll shit back, right? So that means that you constantly have to be, you have to be vigilant, you have to know who your people are so that when the time comes, you can, you can act. So um, one of the agencies that we've been working with for the last couple of years is the LA County Department of Public Works. So public works, are, they're all engineers, right? It's interesting, there's actually no planners on staff. Um, and you know, when I talked about that coupling of high school students and engineers and USC Price, you know, this meant that there were engineers coming into a high school classroom in East LA trying to work with students and students trying to figure out how the hell to work with an engineer. Um, to continue that process, just as we've been talking about, we have to acknowledge a few things. First off, the engineers were excited to come to the classroom because they may not be from East LA, but they're from communities that perhaps aren't that different. Um, they don't get opportunities to work with students. They like their job, so they want to talk about what they do. They want to like share the opportunity, but then the question is like, how do you perpetuate that within this big, gigantic, enormous institution where we're talking about just a couple of engineers and there's thousands of people and tons of divisions? And that's the long game, right? That's about perseverance, first off, on our part. We got to be a little stubborn, right? And we got to push, as you're talking about, about, okay, hi, I know you're, you weren't part of this project last year, but we did work with your agency. We got some credibility. Yes, we can do this again. You know, uh, right now I'm trying to arrange a field trip where the students are coming to public works early on in the year. And, you know, I, I got, we're up the chain now because I talked to the deputy director. So, but the deputy director has no clue who we are, right? So it's an ongoing river for sure, right? But we at least are a little bit more downstream now than we were when we began. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that um, I see in your work, and then I think sometimes we forget when we're doing this kind of stuff, is that part of what sets up the, that output or the product being the goal is because people are, are craving something tangible, yeah. that the things that we're pushing mm -hmm. them towards, it's, it, you described it in your talk, it's this uncertainty. And mm -hmm. not a lot of people do well with uncertainty. Oh, yeah. um, okay. Our current political crisis exemplifying that. And so I'm, I'm super interested in this idea of using art, design, any creative act to create things that can feel tangible and can almost feel like markers in the river, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of like looking and just seeing a sea of water and nothing that helps you feel grounded, mm -hmm. how do you place these things in the way that like, oh, we're here, right? Like the stuff that you presented almost seemed like, in, even in a project that could last years, they were an acknowledgement of here's where we are and here's where we've arrived from and here's the next marker, roughly, yeah. that we're going to. And do you find that you use that, not necessarily that framing, yeah. but do you it's find- framing. <laughs> I mean, I borrow that. Feel um. free. <laughs> <laughs> but do you find, as you're thinking of what to do next, that you're kind of working with that frame of how are you helping to guide people in this, this sense of uncertainty? Um, I would say that it, it is something that we do, right? Because we, um, when, when we talked about, you know, that we're all going to die, yes, we're not here forever, we need to be able to figure out what our, what our exit strategy is or what our transition out is, meaning, like, what capacities, structures, resources do we want to have put into place so that other folks can, can, can take it over and shape it themselves, right? Um, so, we, so we do think about that. Um, 
And I think your, your point is extremely well taken. We, we, need, we all need reinforcements along the way. We need to figure out, like, even if we're not getting at solutions, capital L, that maybe we have some wins. We have some successes. Success is not the same as solutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think tangible things like making sure that, you know, when we were doing the slow jams, just having these, like, you know, good or bad, like, events, like, having them where people could be public. And there's a low barrier to participation where the props are just kind of out. And anyone walking by who's like, what's this? I need to cross the street can be like, yeah, here, let us escort you or please take a prop, right? Um, and it's an immediate thing where um, for the, the parents um, and the other participants, the seniors, it was a way for them to harness a sense of power and possibility. They're like, I'm doing something. It's not some marketing firm that's like giving the message to these drivers. Like, I am telling them this. I am telling them, them this, and they're seeing me because I matter. What I say is important, right? So kind of make sure that we're building it along the way. So, and, and I want to return to that story about the engagement with the public works engineers and the high school students from East LA, because last year, uh, LA County was rolling out its version of Vision Zero. So they were rolling out you know, the Vision Zero Action Plan, which was, a, I don't know, 60-page document online. And public commentary was an online form, uh, yay big, English only. And you know, if you could find that form, wow, you were, you were pretty amazing because <laughs> it was completely inaccessible. So it's inaccessible on so many levels to the community. So part of that idea about the uncomfortable is also like, how do we make something that's uncomfortable, first off, not seem like a threat, but also something that's welcome and embrace the unfamiliar. So not only were the students and the engineers problem solving together, where the students are sharing what they know, which is like what actually happens on the streets, right? They can point to, the county identifies them as collision concentration corridors, right? So um, a really jargony term for a street that's not so safe, right? Um, students know them from what actually happens and transpires. Engineers know them from data sets that they get from Caltrans. They, that's all they have. So there's an exchange that happens, but the wonderful thing that happened was we also, the students made zines. And they made zines from the perspective of, if these streets could talk, what would they tell you? So not only were, you know, they were doing the problem solving around, well, if we put in a you know, left turn lane here, or we do a bulb out curb extension, you know, students learned all that kind of like, you know, uh, work. But the zines were actually the things that the engineers got excited about, because it encapsulated a different type of data, again, that was they weren't, didn't have privy to. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, not something that maybe they would have been comfortable, like they weren't gonna go out and make a zine, but it came from a group of students. It's, wow, this is cool. Yeah, I love this idea of reframing what data is. I feel like I often end up doing that in my, mm -hmm. in my work, and I think that you know, if we talk about how um, sort of artistic practice has greater agency. It's sort of to expand the mind in terms of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the, the typical normative thing, the idea is that data is quant, as you said, right? And so the qualitative data, whether it's a zine or whether it's someone's stories, as you were talking, I was reminded a, a quote that I often use um, from Brene Brown that says, stories are data with a soul. Mm. And um, I think, you know, we're using um, creativity to bring in these soul stories into these projects. Um, and hopefully that informs them in a completely different way. And I think your work shows that. What I'm curious about is, especially in this arc of, um, you described yourself as the connective tissue, mm -hmm. but you've also talked about being able to exit at some point. Mm -hmm. And so, Ideally, what happens is that other people come in and form that connective tissue so that you can leave. 
So in thinking about data and redefining this different way in which data can be done, are you finding in any of your projects that in whether it's successive parts of the project or additional projects that the folks you've been working with are doing, that they're taking the same sort of creative way of thinking about data beyond, right? So that you don't have to be the one helping to foster it, but that it's, it's sprinkled. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the parents of Padres and Acción um, have continued the work. Like they continue to advocate for it um, because for them it's personal. Like they, they actually, so the, the parents are from two schools, Camino Nuevo Charter Academy and Vista Charter Middle School. Both of those schools have had students and staff hit by cars. Hit by cars is like 20 feet up hit by cars, wow. right? And this is a street with a lot of schools, a lot of senior centers, and people are whipping through it. They're speeding through it. They want, they want safer streets. So this is something that they're already invested in. Like our, you know, our piece in the puzzle was to help connect them with other folks. So now they're, they're working with our friends at Los Angeles Walks. Um, and through that, like, uh, you know, while, while we were working with them, we connected them with, a, um, with planners, like actual like urban planners who could help them speak about what they wanted to see in a way that, um, that, that public agencies would understand. Um, and so at, at the end of this last year, we, um, like they, they invited me, they were so excited because they were hosting another open house um, to talk about traffic safety. So in the time, um, you know, we, we hadn't really seen them for a little while, but in that time since, they had continued to work with LA Walks been in touch with LADOT, and managed to have a connection with the, the local city council office, such that at that holiday open house, the council member for the district was present. So he was, he was there, right? Um, and just to have that level of acknowledgement, the fact that he, he has a busy schedule, he'll show up because their voices are important. Um, and so I think, you know, that's what we, that's what we strive to do, right? And I'm, I'm so excited for them that they're, uh, that they continue to do this work. There's a lot more work that needs to be done, but they're there to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, just, uh, in, I want to tie that back to this idea that it seems like part of it isn't just about, um, those who are already in power and transforming the way they think, but actually using this process to give power to those who have either been stripped of it or never given it in the first place so that in some ways they're rising into the role mm -hmm. that you served when you were in the project. And then that's one way to kind of balance in these changing dynamics. Right, and I mean, that's where, the, and that's where the emphasis needs to be, Yeah. right? Not really on us. Yeah. Yes. We're, we're, we're good enablers. Yeah. You know? um, so I'm supposed to wrap up, but I'm just going to give one quick question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moderator's prerogative. <laughs> Gave me the mic. Now I'm going to use my power. <laughs> um, but I, 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 the question I want to ask, I think, is a, it's a good one as sort of as we're about to go out into other conversations and breakout mm -hmm. sessions is, you know, I was really struck by how long your projects lasted, and I would almost say it's how long the relationship building took. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think about the time that we're in right now, and already from projects in general, there's always a sense of urgency, right? Yes. Somebody comes to you and says, I, I have a grant that's gonna expire in six months, we need to be right. done by then, mm -hmm. right? Yep. yep. I'm from the knowing laughter, so there are others who've heard this. <laughs> um, and then right now with the sort of climate that we're living in, things just feel urgent all yeah. the time. Right. And so how do we create space to reframe time in this era where Ooh. everything, the pressure, sorry, I'm asking a hard it's question deep. for the Antoine. It's philosophical yeah. And you can also say I don't know the answer to it, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to right. like figure out how do we create space to sort of say that there is time to do the thing that is right, right in a time where everything feels urgent and almost falling apart. So um, 
there was a slide that uh, we didn't show with an image for when, when we did Temple Street Slow Jams. We also partnered with, uh, it's called Gabba Gallery, and they, they, they got a few artists, one of whom is an artist uh, called Wordsmith, and put up these wheat paste signs, and one of them said, slow down, life is not a race, right? And so that, that came to mind as you said that, right? Because I think, you know, and, and Rhian and I, when we were talking about kind of preparing for this, we were talking about the scarcity kind of like mindset of like, well, we don't have enough money. Right. We don't have enough resources. We, you know, there's too many challenges. What are we gonna do? I, I think, you know, what I hope comes across is, you know, we're wildly ambitious with our goals and our work. Right, but we also recognize what that requires. Um, we recognize that it's a commitment that's going to move above and beyond a particular grant cycle or a term. It's about you know, also as we were presenting, I hope it kind of came through that we don't just respond to like here's the opportunity to apply to be you know for this grant or the artists are in residence for this or whatever it may be. We're building projects as we're building relationships, as we're building partnerships, and we're trying to build them at a scale that gives us more time because we also know that, you know, there's that phrase about like moving in community time, right? That's not on a six month cycle. Building trust alone Look, that's, that takes time, right? It, and, and, you know, six months is not enough time for me to embed my trust in somebody. So why would we expect that an entire neighborhood or community would do that? I like to say that uh, building trust is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. So um, can, we, <laughs> can we give a thank to Mike and Rianne?